Talmudic wisdom suggests that a rabbi should be in a joyful mood before he begins his sermon, but overcome with awe once he begins to speak. It seems that the ancient sage Rabbah would attempt to say something humorous before teaching so those listening to him would share in both his happy and his reverent moods. So here goes. Many years ago, my wife Robin and I had the occasion to travel to a family wedding. And Robin was having trouble on the airline's website, so she called the airline to speak with an operator in order to make reservations. And over the phone, she explained to the clerk that she would be traveling ahead on Thursday, and because of my work, I would be joining her late Saturday evening. And she said to the operator, my husband needs to travel on Saturday night after the sun has set. Why? inquired the clerk. Is he a vampire? <laughs> no, replied Robin, just a rabbi. <laughs> My mood is upbeat today, and I hope yours is too. As we begin the new Jewish year, what could possibly upset us? This is actually my message. We cannot let what's wrong deter us from pursuing what's right. Jewish lore imagines God and Abraham in conversation. Just as Abraham looks up and sees a ram stuck in the bushes nearby to replace his son Isaac, whom he has infamously bound on the sacrificial altar. We read in the Midrash, The Holy One, blessed be God, said to Abraham, In the future, your descendants will also be entangled in troubles, and they too will be redeemed by the horn of a ram. After we sound that ram's horn, the shofar, in just a few more moments in Musaf, we then declare our redemption. Hayom harat olam. Today the world is created anew. Though so much may disturb and distress us in the worlds of our nation, our people, nature, or upset and challenge us in the worlds of our personal lives, our families and our friends, all of which matters a great deal, and none of which do I dismiss or disregard. Yet on this day, which symbolically marks the world's recreation, it is the awesome gift, the awesome wonder of our lives, the profound and meaningful purposes of our days that must inspire us. We recreate the worlds of our experience by raising ourselves up to imagine rather than to despair, to hope, not to worry, to reach for more, not settle for less. This, I believe, is our greatest challenge and need. I know some of what upsets you in me, my quest right now is to discover what inspires us. Jewish tradition imagines that we are to answer this question at the end of our days. I want to answer it today. Tzapita Yeshua. Did you hope for better days? Did you hope for redemption? Did you dream and imagine what could be? or merely complain about and accept what is. Ours is not just to watch, to wallow, and to wait for things to get better. Rather, it is up to us to elevate our sights, raise our expectations, and live in the world that is as we believe it ought to be. To live on every day we are blessed to greet with hope, with determination, 
and moral clarity. That's what we do during this sacred season. We strive to go higher and higher for our sake, for the sake of our society. This year we must live inspired lives. Indeed, raise your sights and look upward toward the ark. In every synagogue hangs the eternal light, a ner tamid. We derive this from the words of Torah directed to Aaron, the Kohen Gadol, the ancient Israelite high priest. He was to kindle and elevate an eternal light, la'alot ner tamid, a lamp in front of the curtain hiding the tablets of the covenant in the ancient Mishkan. And about this symbol, Jewish tradition understands the light of God's presence to be a light of inspiration and holiness, shining into our hearts and our souls the enduring values of goodness, of love, and of hope. It is in all of our heritage, among our most inspiring symbols, the lights of the sanctuary, of Shabbat and festival, the lights of memory and mourning, all of the lights we kindle touch us deeply and move us to remember, to honor, to celebrate, and to rejoice. Light reflecting God's presence illuminates our way and brightens the darkness of any personal or emotional night. And I'm here to tell you, we need such light. We need such inspiration in our lives. We know what amuses us. We know what makes us sad. We see and hear so much that is crass, that is vulgar, that is disheartening. But what elevates us? What motivates us? What inspires us? I'll share my list. Consider your own. Most often, I'm inspired by other people. People who challenge themselves, who rise above and overcome, who reach out to others, who live by their principles, who do what is right, and who accept responsibility for what they did wrong. I can think of role models through my life who encouraged my own life's path. I can bring to mind the impressive, compassionate, and brave acts of others. A person's goodness, a person's kindness, a person's love compel my own. Ideas also elevate our hearts and our minds. They are a potent source of motivation and meaning. Simple or profound, various thoughts can move us and cause us to reflect. Or consider your memories, or sacred texts, or music and art, exploration, curiosity, even athletics. There is much to inspire us if we seek it out. We thrill in nature's wonders and humanity's creativity. Family and community, too, become sources of inspiration, especially as we derive some of our values from our association with others. This is our goal. Find sources of inspiration for our lives. That's why we're here. We seek this inspiration because in our more somber mood, you and I are wary, weary too. The culture in which we live is morally sick. Our society is ailing. The symptoms are all too evident and widespread. We are numbed by violence and the murder of school children. Incivility and lying 
division and derision, distrust and deception, hatred and racism, economic instability and social inequity. From our aspirational place of higher hopes, we look down on these realities. And we're not alone. A journalist named Elizabeth Brunig describes our moral decline this way. She writes, American life is not about what is good. It is rather about nothing at all. If life is about nothing, if no sense of purpose or meaning inspires, people despair. They make excuses. They lose trust. They deny reality. They cast blame. Earlier, I said we cannot let what's wrong deter us from pursuing what's right. My focus today is on the sources of our inspiration and not our frustration. In the what's wrong category, however, I make this one exception. Because what I will now share will have special resonance with us in a synagogue. And it has larger relevance to so much else that is upsetting us. Over the summer, two men were sitting outside on the patio of True Foods, the restaurant at the UTC Mall. And there they were sitting, waiting for their lunch order. Now apparently these two friends were Jewish because while sitting there, they were subjected to a hateful and bizarre anti-Semitic tirade. A man cast blame. And recording his own vile attack, he screamed, among other things, and I apologize for quoting him, the Goyim are starting to wake up. You guys have your own ethnostate. You guys are trying to demantle, dismantle civilization. And after they threatened to call the police, he told them, Call your Shabbos goys. And then he stopped filming and posted this hatred to Twitter. No one was physically hurt. Recently, there have been many more and worse anti-Semitic incidents in this country and around the world. Even so, watching this video was disturbing. I didn't recognize either of the men. I assume they're not here with us today. I'm also not sure how their attacker knew they were Jewish. I showed the video to Robin, who asked me, what would I do in that situation? A question I'll come back to in a moment. Professor of Foreign Affairs and Humanities at Bard College, Walter Russell Mead, explains the larger significance of this and every other anti-Semitic episode. He writes, the rise of anti-Semitism is a sign of widespread social and cultural failure. It is a leading indicator of a loss of faith in liberal values and of a diminished capacity to understand the modern world and thrive in it. Societies that tolerate anti-Semitism take a fateful step toward the loss of both freedom and prosperity. If that's so, I'll take the professor's words at face value for the moment. If that's so, then we Jews represent the exact opposite of an anti-Semite's screed. How we present ourselves to the world must imagine a future bigots cannot see. 
A future in which human decency and goodness thrive. A future in which Jewish life is dynamic and engaging, a demonstration of personal meaning and common purpose. We must respond to hatred with pride. If I were the target of that man's disgusting words at UTC, assuming I felt safe, and before or after calling the police, I hope I would have said to him something like this. Thanks for the reminder. I'm always proud to be a Jew. I only wish you knew what the hell you were talking about so you could be proud of you, too. We respond to others' ignorant and hideous hate for us from a posture of confidence, conviction, and pride. We are not Jewish because they hate us. We are Jewish because we love the values and ideals of our people's historic and enduring heritage. Beyond all necessary and appropriate security and physical defense efforts, which we take with profound regret and great responsibility, we must positively stand up for who we are and most of all, actively live and keep alive our unique privilege to be Jews. We Jews endure because belonging to a people Transcendent of borders, transcendent of boundaries, transcendent of race, because we belong to a people that provides us with our optimistic outlook, a worldview of hope, and visions of daily, weekly, seasonal meaning for our sake, for the sake of our people. We must live inspired Jewish lives, which means, my dear friends, it's time to come home. It's time to renew and rebuild our communal bond as a synagogue family. We cannot truly live inspired Jewish lives alone. Together, we each inspire each other with our presence and our caring, as it always has been. I make this covenant not with you alone, God's voice through Moses tells our ancient Israelite ancestors standing at Mount Sinai. I make this covenant not with you alone, but with those who are standing here with us today before the eternal our God, and with those who are not here with us this day. It is of us, later generations unknowable once upon a time, that this verse of Torah speaks. We Jews are a group bound by covenants of history and fate, collective memories and cherished faith. The Jewish people's covenant with each other and God is a transcendent, imperceptible, inspirational pull we feel at those moments in our lives when connecting to Jews and Jewish tradition is important to us. The Jewish people's covenant must be more compelling and inspiring to us than our proper concerns about anti-Semitism. As the late Rabbi David Hartman said about the Holocaust and Zionism, we will mourn forever because of the memory of Auschwitz. We will build a healthy new society because of the memory of Sinai. As you and I emerge, from the shadows of pandemic darkness and disruption. We step into a New Year's light of hope and resolve. I hope climbing higher and higher toward the visions and ideals in which we believe and by which we must live. Here's what I encourage you to do this year. I encourage you more than hope for better days, for the sake of us, for the sake of our society, we must live inspired lives. We must step up into the light of God's inspiration. Living inspired lives means living with personal resolve. Easier said than done, as we all understand. So begin 
by paying attention to the people who represent decency and honesty that you value. Don't pay attention to those whose noise and news diverts you. Don't pay attention to what's wrong. Focus on what's right. Step up higher by consciously speaking honestly yourself and acting with personal integrity. Step up still higher by caring, be kind and good. Expect decency and kindness. Don't settle for less than the highest possible demonstration of your character and your values. And here's what else I encourage you to do this year. I know it's a cliche on Rosh Hashanah for a rabbi to ask the congregation to be present and involved. It's not really my style. But after 31 pandemic months thus far, we all need the meaning and connections at the heart of synagogue and Jewish life. It's time to come home. It's time to renew and rebuild our communal bond as a synagogue family. I encourage you to commit yourself anew to honor our people's eternal covenant. For our sake, for the sake of our people, we must live inspired lives. Begin by becoming part of our volunteer community. We need your talent and your insights to imagine and create a shared future. Step up higher by becoming part of our caring community. We are devoted to God by caring for one another through ailments and anxiousness and being present to one another at happy and sad times. Step up still higher by becoming part of our learning community. Find inspiration in Jewish texts and ideas, in questions and exploration, in discussion and debate. And step up even higher by becoming part of our Shabbat community, the most sacred and inspiring symbol of our people's historic covenant is Shabbat. It is a day each week of light and gladness set aside to reconnect, to rejoice, and to set down our roots. I want to conclude today by sharing with you an abridged version of Yud Lamed Peretz's famous Yiddish folktale. The story goes like this. Early every Friday morning, during the weeks before the High Holy Days, the rabbi of Nemirov would vanish. He was nowhere to be seen. He wasn't in the synagogue, he wasn't in the study house, he wasn't at the minion, and he certainly was not at home. Where could the rabbi be? Now the townsfolk believed that their rabbi of Nimirov ascended to heaven during the days before Rosh Hashanah. After all, a rabbi has plenty of business to take care of just before the days of awe. Well, one week, a man from another town came to visit. When asked where he thought the missing rabbi was, he laughed. <laughs> it's not my business, he said, shrugging. Yet all the while curious, he began to scheme to find out. So one Thursday night, right after evening prayers, the visitor steals into the rabbi's room and he slides under the rabbi's bed and he waits. And early the next morning, the rabbi arises. He dresses in peasant clothes and from his coat pocket dangles the end of a heavy peasant rope. And the rabbi leaves and his unseen visitor follows him. And on the way, the rabbi stops to make a bundle of wood and ties it with the rope in his pocket. And next, the rabbi stops at a back street besides a small, broken-down shack, and he knocks on the window. Who's there? asks the frightened voice of a sick woman. Vassal, the rabbi answers. I see you are cold. I'll kindle a fire, explains the rabbi as he enters. And as the rabbi puts the wood into the oven, he recites in a groan the first portion of his morning prayers. And as he kindles the fire and the wood burns brightly, he recites a bit more joyously the second portion of the prayers. And when the fire was all set and blazing, he recites the third portion and shuts the stove. 
And the man from out of town who saw all of this became a disciple and a student of the rabbi. And ever after, when another disciple tells how the rabbi of Nemirov ascends to heaven during the days before Rosh Hashanah, the man no longer laughs. He only adds, if not higher. That's what we can all do during and after this sacred season. Realize this. As our children and grandchildren grow, as we ourselves continue to age and engage, as we put ourselves out into the world every new year and each new day, we hope and we pray that people are decent and kind, honest and good. Which is why my message today is the challenge of our times. We must strive to go higher and higher, bringing warmth where there is cold, light where there is dark, and inspiration where it is needed most. In this new year, let each one of us step up even more than we have before, if not higher. Shana Tovah.